Hello Classic Rock fans, I am reporting the day after seeing Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band perform at the Pfizer Forum in Milwaukee as part of his 2023 world tour. This was my fourth time seeing Bruce Springsteen. I saw him in the E Street Band play Milwaukee's Harley Fest, which was Harley Davidson's 105th anniversary uh, celebration back in 2008. I saw him play the old Bradley Center in 2009, in which he did his whole Born to Run album. And in 2016, I saw him again at the old Bradley Center when he was playing the full um, album of The River all the way through in concert. And I don't think I'm going to break any news today by saying that the show I saw last night was excellent. It was just a wonderful experience. It's uh, The E Street Band is the very best that the classic rock genre has to offer as far as live performance goes. I don't think I have a single critique about the show itself. Springsteen has a reputation for truly incredible live shows and anytime you go see him he lives up and even exceeds expectations. So my review of the performance itself is totally positive. But there are some things that are not the performance that are involved with uh, this tour that uh, some fans are not crazy about, particularly the pricing of the tickets, the so-called dynamic pricing that a lot of fan bases are suffering uh, with. Thank you, Ticketmaster. The first round of this story, I believe, started with Blink-182 and their reunion tour, and fans were shocked at the prices that were set for that tour and that's how I believe most of us came to learn the phrase dynamic pricing and then Springsteen and when I got my tickets I was very lucky I bought my tickets the minute they went on sale I went to the cheapest price range and selected the first batch I saw on an aisle and thankfully my order went through and I paid the uh, lowest amount for tickets uh, as they went on sale. You know what that price level was? $200 a seat which is among the most expensive ticket I've ever bought for a show. I think the most I've ever paid for a ticket at a concert was the Rolling Stones and I paid somewhere around 375 but I had pretty good seats for that. Uh, the tickets that I got this round for Bruce Springsteen were in the upper level. Not the worst seats, but far enough up that you definitely felt like you were in the cheapest range of tickets. But going back to what I was saying about dynamic pricing, is, this story does not begin and end with Springsteen. Uh, it continued on uh, when Taylor Swift's tour went on sale and her fan base was largely enraged by this. There was like what, a congressional hearing or something? And then just recently again with Beyonce and her tour. These are huge stadium acts and Ticketmaster's excuse for this really shitty pricing thing that they're doing is that, well, if we didn't do it, scalper sites would buy up the tickets and sell them at exploitive prices themselves. So if someone's going to get that money, why not the artists? and also Ticketmaster. Uh, <laughs> and it's very frustrating because it's bullshit and the fans know it's bullshit and Ticketmaster knows it's bullshit and the artist knows it's bullshit. And it's bullshit because it's a um, matter of supply and demand and there's a lot more demand uh, than I guess supply. But supply is totally up to Ticketmaster and the artist. If Springsteen was doing, say, a two-night stand in Milwaukee, he would absolutely sell out both shows, and he could do that if Ticketmaster set a more reasonable price so that more, I guess, casual fans or more economically challenged fans could make their way in. But Ticketmaster doesn't want to do that because the scarcity is the point. That's their leverage. I live in Milwaukee. The last time Springsteen played here was 2016. So, 
and, and before that it was 2009. So we're kind of at a once every seven to eight years of seeing him, and he's in his 70s. So if we want to see Springsteen in our city, the opportunities are few and far between. And that is enough for people to dig deep in their wallets to pay, quite frankly, unreasonable prices. And that's the leverage that Ticketmaster has. And I think that Springsteen fans in particular are outraged by this because Springsteen has always stood against that sort of exploitation. He's been asked about it. He seems to be sort of shrugging his shoulders at the reality of it. And he doesn't seem to be willing to fight, as he has in the past, to keep ticket prices reasonable for his fan base. And maybe it's because he thinks this might be one of the last times he goes out on the road at this capacity. And, you know, one more big payday b before his days of big production touring come to an end is very appealing to him. I guess I could understand that, but I just feel like there's other ways to increase revenue without leveraging your fans to the degree that Ticketmaster has shamelessly been doing uh, all this year across multiple different fan bases. You know, I said to my friend in line, the one of the, the saddest but true silver linings of the era of classic rock stars being able to tour coming to a close is that at some point I'm going to be done seeing stadium shows. And if the industry keeps up like this, I'm not going to miss it. I'm not going to miss uh, the exploitation that Ticketmaster engages in. And I'm subject to it now because I love music more than I hate Ticketmaster. So unfortunately I will play their game. I will do it best I can to avoid those brutal prices. And you know, I'll always try to find a good deal to get in the door. It just disappoints me that the leveraging and the exploitation on behalf of Ticketmaster just seems to be getting worse from year to year. The treatment of fans seems to be getting worse and worse every year. And there has to come a point where fans say, fuck this, you know? <laughs> I mean, if this was any other band doing it, here's a great example. The Eagles were just here in Milwaukee. I don't even think I looked at tickets. Like, I think I looked a few weeks before the show just to see what they were, but I had no intention of buying because I know they don't care about the fans uh, getting screwed over with prices. In fact, they're kind of in favor of it. They kind of like that. And if the Eagles come to Milwaukee, and they do fairly often, at least more often than Bruce Springsteen, because I know about how they price their tickets, I don't bother even looking. I saw the Eagles once back in 2008. I sat pretty far up close because I went with my uncle and my uncle bought the tickets. And it's so funny, I'm just realizing this now. You know what my uncle paid for those tickets, which were in the 100 level and pretty close? $200. And that was a lot of money back then in 2008 for a good seat. That was a lot of money for a good seat. And here we are 15 years later and I paid $200 to sit pretty far up. I know a lot of Springsteen fans are, are frustrated about the ticket prices this year and I'm one of them, but at the end of the day, it did not ruin the concert for me. The performance was amazing. When I was at the show, I didn't think about the ticket prices for even a second. If you're like me and feeling some frustration about the amount of money you spent to go see him, rest assured that when you do see him, you'll forget all about it because he's still performing at an extremely high level. And ultimately, for music fans, I think it makes it worth it. So let's talk about the show itself. Now, unfortunately, due to some circumstances out of my control, I was not able to be at my seat uh, at the start of the show, so I missed the first couple songs. But he opened the night with No Surrender, Ghosts, and Prove It All Night. Uh, I could hear the songs, because we were in the building, 
And then for us, the show really kicked into gear with The Promised Land, which is such a great song uh, from Darkness on the Edge of Town. Candy's Room, Kitty's Back. Again, classic Springsteen tracks that he's played probably at almost every show. Those are some of his favorites to play. And then he did Night Shift, which is a cover of the old Commodores hit from the early 80s. And that's off his new covers record called Only the Strong Survive. The Commodores' original song, Night Shift, is awesome. I don't think Springsteen's cover is better than the original, but he played it really well, and it's just a beautiful song. He doesn't change it up all that much. So it's just a, an effective presentation of a classic track, and one that, for some people, might be a little lost to time. After that, he played a song called Pay Me My Money Down, which I did not know, but it only took a few moments uh, for me to get the gist of and start singing along with. <laughs> so that was just a lot of fun. Uh, that's one of the great things about Springsteen shows, is so many of the songs are big sing-along numbers. You know, one of the nice things about being as far up as I was is that people didn't seem to mind that my group and I stood for most of the show, and the, the people behind us were also standing, and that's why we felt okay standing. Because I don't go to a Springsteen show to sit, you know, the whole night. This is a energetic, sing-along kind of night. And even for songs you don't know, most of them have that awesome, uh, crowd-pleasing energy. And like I said, I didn't know this song, Pay Me My Bunny Down, but man, it was fun singing to it. After that, he did a song called Burn and Train, and then the, I guess, special, unique song of the set list of the night, the song that he debuted uh, for Milwaukee on this tour was Death to My Hometown. It was the first time he played that track since, like, 2017, and that is one of my favorite songs of his post-2000. And I know that sounds like a qualifier, but it, it it's really not, because I like a lot of post-2000 Springsteen. Death to My Hometown probably ranks in the top 20 of his whole career. I love that song. It's, it's about the 2008 uh, housing crisis, and it's just got some brutal lyrics. Just one of the most eviscerating <laughs> numbers of a corrupt system that I've ever heard. Sing it hard and sing it well, send the robber barons straight to hell, the greedy thieves who came around and ate the flesh of everything they found, whose crimes have gone unpunished now, who walk the streets as free men now. That to me is just one of the greatest examples ever of protest music. You know, a lot of people are turned off by protest songs, and I get that, because it can be preachy. But if you believe that an artist can effectively communicate a social or political message via song, if that can be done, Bruce does it. And Bruce does it extremely well. He did it with Born in the USA, and he did it in uh, 2012 on the Wrecking Ball album with this track, death to my hometown. So hearing that song as like the special song for the Milwaukee concert, that was a real treat. I am so <laughs> glad that was the one that got busted out. I didn't know what he was going to surprise us with. In the past, I remember in 2009, the surprise song, if you will, that we got was, I think, Growing Up and Living Proof. And those are good songs, but they didn't connect with me in the same level that this one did, so this was a real treat. After that, he did the E Street Shuffle, and then he did his only extended monologue to the crowd where he talked about his very first band that he was in when he was a teenager. And he said he was in this band called the Castiles for three years in the 60s with a couple of his uh, friends who were also teenagers. So he's retelling what it was like being in a band with his friends when they were all teenagers. And then he talked about how um, one of the guys in the band sadly passed away not too long ago. 
and that left Bruce as the last man standing, if you will, of that original group. And that carries some pretty heavy emotions. So he wrote a song called Last Man Standing. And after telling that story, he went into that song, which is a really beautiful song. And that song sort of spoke to kind of this overarching theme of, I guess, acknowledging mortality. And I'll touch more on that in just a little bit, but uh, we'll put a pin in that for now. After that, we moved into the big uh, grand finale, if you will, of the main set with big hit songs like Backstreets, Because the Night, She's the One, Wrecking Ball, The Rising, and Badlands. Some of these are big radio hits and some of these are just crowd favorites. These are sing-along tracks that the diehard fans know. These are the songs that get you out of your seat and, you know, pumping your fist and singing along and having a great time. And Springsteen has such a catalog of songs that you know, the end of any show he does is going to be packed with hit after hit after hit. Really, the only person I can think of who sort of rivals him in this aspect of their live shows is Paul McCartney. McCartney kind of does this too. The first two thirds of his set are a mix of hits and deep cuts and some stuff he kind of changes up as the tour goes on. And then the last quarter or third of the show, if you will, are surefire crowd pleasers that really end the main set on a very strong note. He goes off stage and he comes back out with an encore that has a seemingly even bigger run of these classic hit songs that fans love. And Springsteen does that too. So McCartney and Springsteen are really the only two I can think of that do this at that same level. And here at the end are also some of my favorite of Springsteen songs. Backstreets, Because the Night, uh, She's the One is my dad's favorite song, and my dad was at that show too. He actually had a better seat than me. It makes me happy that Springsteen always plays She's the One, because I know that's my dad's favorite song of his. And my dad saw Springsteen a number of times back in the 70s. Like, he saw him really early on. I know at at least one show, my dad was at a small venue and was up pretty close and saw him. And he also saw him on the Born in the USA tour that came through Alpine Valley here. And uh, I saw Springsteen with my dad at that Harley Davidson celebration in 2008. And that's probably my favorite concert ever. And Badlands is the perfect song to end the main set on because that is maybe his best example of a sing-along or or actually shout-along, scream-along uh, kind of track. It ain't no sin to be glad you're alive. I mean, that's just so much fun. It's just joy, pure joy in those moments, and pure joy with thousands of other people experiencing that exact same pure joy. And that's the magic of live music. And then the band came out for its encore set, which included Land of Hope and Dreams, Thunder Road, Rosalita, Glory Days, Dancing in the Dark, 10th Avenue Freeze Out. Again, these are just some of the best classic rock songs ever recorded. One little technical snafu. I, I wasn't sure if it was supposed to happen, but whenever he does Born to Run, he brings the lights up for the whole arena. And for one song, yeah, that's awesome. But the lights stayed on for a couple of songs after, and I'm not sure if they were supposed to. Um, if they are, that's fine. It didn't affect the show in a negative way. I just remember that was a little odd because in the past when he's done that, the lights have come up for Born to Run, but then they go back off when that song's done. But in this case, the lights stayed on for most of the encore. During 10th Avenue Freeze Out, which was the last song with the whole band, is Springsteen came off stage and went to the catwalk in the middle of the round of the arena and, you know, high-fived fans and sang out in the middle of the venue and he chugged a beer. <laughs> you can bet he chugged a beer. And that 
was like a really cool moment. I'm glad he's still doing that. That is a tradition that if he stopped, I think the show would be missing something. He didn't do any crowd surfing this time around. I've seen him do that in the past. He's honestly probably a little too old to be fucking around with something like that, so I'm, I'm fine with him not doing the crowd surfing anymore, but coming out uh, to the middle of the floor to, to sing to the fans in the middle of the arena, that's fun. That's fun, so I'm glad he did that. So then the band goes off stage, and the last song of the night that Bruce did was a song called I'll See You In My Dreams, which is another new track. And it was just him, acoustic, and the lyrics of that song are very emotional. And the lyrics of that song are an acknowledgement of mortality. And I think mortality is something that's been on Springsteen's mind over these last couple of years. It's definitely in his book. And if not that, like many, if not all of his peers, he's definitely been considering how long he can keep this up. How long can he keep doing shows of this scale to this many markets? Because there is a global demand for Springsteen. How much more can he keep doing this at this level when he's in his 70s? And I keep going back to the fact that it's been seven years since I last saw him in Milwaukee. And if it's got to be another seven-year wait before he comes back here, there's no guarantee. And I would say there's not even a likelihood that he'd be physically able to perform at the level that he's doing right now. So... My friends and I talked about this before the show. We are definitely aware of the possibility that this really might have been the last time that he'll play Milwaukee. And if that's the case, this was a beautiful song to close the set with. And it's, of course, extremely bittersweet. Definitely very emotional. But not unpleasant. Not unwelcome. Very appropriate. So, do I recommend seeing Bruce Springsteen? Yes. Any chance you get, go see him. Do I recommend you do that at any price? No. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of fans have been straight up priced out of this tour. And that's horrible. But it's reality. So, if that's the boat you're in, I feel for you. And I hope it doesn't ruin your fandom of Springsteen. The music lives forever. And if you've seen him in concert before, at least you have those memories. But if you've been priced out or if you, on principle, aren't going, I can appreciate that. I can understand that. Because it is extremely frustrating. But at this point, I'm shouting at a brick wall. And I know Ticketmaster is not hearing me. And they don't care if they did hear me. <laughs> Just the nature of the beast. The exploitation of the music fan is always going to be a thing. And hopefully the best fans can find ways to escape or navigate around said exploitation. And then just a, a funny addendum to the story. After the show ended, one of my friends and I went to a nearby bar called Buck Bradley's to have a beer after the show. Because, honestly, coming out of a Springsteen show, I can't sleep. <laughs> my The positivity is just too high. I gotta ride that out a little bit. I gotta have a beer. I gotta I gotta hear some more Springsteen music. I gotta talk about what a great show it was and you know my friends the same way. So we went over to the bar, we had a beer, and thankfully Buck Bradley's put on I think the Pandora station for Springsteen because like every other song was a Bruce Springsteen song. Including hilariously Santa Claus is coming to town. <laughs> It's, it's March. It's coming to town. March. That's a great memory. That's something I'm never going to forget about this show. How weird that was. Oh, and one thing I wanted to talk about in the beginning of this and totally forgot. But I'll say this really quick. 
I complained a lot about Ticketmaster, but they're not the only ones I got a little bit of a beef with. I have some frustration at the Pfizer Forum. The lines to get into the venue were insane. And this is something I talked about in my review of the Roger Waters concert I went to. I got down there before doors opened and the line was insane and it was huge. And it was people just waiting to go in and spend money, by the way, on food and merchandise. And the the forum didn't open the doors until the scheduled time of 6.30, as usual. The problem was is that the show started at 7.30. And because of the limited entrance access, there was no way that the entirety of the crowd could get in within that hour. The end of that line got through the doors at about 8 o'clock. Springsteen, thankfully, did not come on stage at 7.30. He came on stage at about 10 to 8. But for the very last people in the line, they came in really through no fault of their own, because that's how this line was. They came in after the show had started, and well after the show was scheduled to start. That's a broken process. You need to be able to get everybody inside before the show starts. Or at least have the ability to get everybody inside. If people show up late, okay, that's one thing. But an hour is not enough time to process that entire crowd through your security measures. And it's like a simple fix. Doors open at 6. How about that? Get the early birds in at least. Because it's not just that it's boring and miserable to stand in line for like 45 minutes. It's counter to the notion of fan safety. It's not a good idea to have a gigantic crowd of people just standing there. So that's something I hope the forum takes a look at for concerts going forward. I think they can do better. They should do better. All right. I've gone on for quite a while here. I think that's all I've got to say about the show. So if you've enjoyed this review, please check out the other concert reviews I have done on this channel. If you're a Bruce Springsteen fan, there's a damn good chance I've talked about a different artist that you like or a different tour that you're interested in or something like that. So please look through the concert reviews I've done. If you're a fan of classic rock, you might want to check out the podcast that I do about classic rock. Had a lot of guests on lately, a lot of interesting conversations. All of my interviews are here on this YouTube channel. And you can find the link to the audio podcast in the description below, along with our social media pages. So please follow us there as well. So with that, thank you for watching. Go see Springsteen if you can. Fuck Ticketmaster. <laughs> and keep rocking.